Hello, I'm Kevin from Gaming the Systems. Welcome to my game room. I have a lot of old stuff in this room. Some of it dates back to the 1970s. In this video, I'm going to attempt to repair some of it because over the years, some of this stuff has started to malfunction. I've been really slow about repairing it because my skills were never really that good and I'm afraid of breaking these things further. I've had some successes. Uh, recently, I've gotten better at repairing things. For instance, I've had a couple videos where I show how to repair a controller, which some of you might have seen. But in this video, I'm just going to grab some of the things on my to-do list and attempt to repair them. And I'm going to have you watching over my shoulder the whole time. Now keep in mind, I am not the biggest technical wizard on YouTube, but like I said, I, my skills have improved a little bit in recent years. So if you see something that I'm doing that could be done in a better way, let me know in the comments section. So without further ado, let's get to the first thing. I'm going to start with the PS1, and for that, there's a malfunction with the open button. It keeps getting stuck. When I press it down, it stays down. And that keeps me from closing the lid. It is broken. Now, if I tap on that open button, it slowly comes all the way back up again. So it's becoming a big problem whenever I want to play the system, and this is one of the systems I play the most of, so I really want to fix this. So I pulled it out of my setup, and while I have it out of there, I'm going to also do some routine cleaning. There's like this white residue that's in the crevices. It's almost like battery corrosion. And so I'm just using some cleaning stuff and a toothbrush. And so I took it apart and I was very surprised on the inside to see rust. With the exception of that button getting stuck, this thing has always functioned well for me, so someone must have stored this in a basement or somewhere moist uh, before I became the owner. And some of that rust and some other dirt has accumulated on the bottom, so what I'm going to do is use my air blower and blow that stuff out. And while I'm blowing that out, I just want to thank my Patreon supporter, Chicago X Japan, for helping to support the channel. I really appreciate it. With that cleaning out of the way, I'm now going to concentrate on the button that gets stuck. The mechanism is held in by screws, and it's basically two pieces of plastic and a spring connected to each other. And there is residue in there, and it's very sticky, so I have a feeling that's what the problem is, so I'm just going to give this thing a very good cleaning. And I'm going to remove the button itself, and I'm going to clean the button orifice. I have trouble describing these things sometimes. I put it back together and put it back in, and then I decided to clean the other buttons to make sure they don't have the same type of residue. And now, the open button is functioning normally again. He is smart. So there's one victory under my belt, and it's time to move on to the next thing. So next up is a Model 2 Sega CD. The unit works just fine, but there's a problem with the fuse that's on the inside of it. Let me explain the Sega CD fuse real quick with this crude drawing, at least how I understand it. The Genesis and the Sega CD both have a power adapter that plugs into the wall. The Genesis has an on-off switch, so if the Genesis is off and there's a surge in the power line, that surge cannot get into the Genesis. The Sega CD, however, does not have an on-off switch. So if it's plugged into the wall and you're not using it, a surge could come through the line and do some damage to the Sega CD. So instead of an on-off switch, they installed a fuse on the inside. If there was a surge, then that fuse would blow, and all of a sudden you have a Sega CD that doesn't work anymore, but at least its electronics have been protected. The fuse took the hit, basically. So when I first got a Sega CD, which was a Model 1 years ago in the 1990s, it stopped working 
working one day and never worked again and I actually returned it to the store. At that point in time I didn't know anything about a fuse on the inside. Years and years later when I bought this Model 2, that one did not work either. So I went inside and I did a bypass on the fuse. I'll explain that in a second. I'm going to take this thing apart. I'm going to remove the RF shielding. A lot of these old systems have RF shielding, uh, particularly if you live in America. And so there's always this elaborate set of screws that holds all that stuff together. While I was in there, I did some de-dusting with the blower. And there on the back, you can see the bypass I made. That white thing there is the fuse that was, I think, original to the system. Now you might say that's dangerous, but it's actually not in my setup. Because in my setup, I have a switch for every single thing. So to my understanding, that helps protect the Sega CD from surges. There might be other reasons for this fuse as well, like if the disc player gets locked up or something. At that time, I didn't have enough skill or confidence to change that fuse out. I probably would have also had trouble finding the right fuse. But either way, I'm going to remove this bypass and remove the old fuse and put in a new fuse. As I said at the beginning of the video, I am not the world's greatest solder expert, but I get better every time I go in and do this kind of thing. So if any of you are interested in repairing your systems, I encourage you to take that path and just realize that it's gonna take a while before you build up enough experience to be able to do this stuff effectively. And uh, the fuse I took off was a surface mount fuse, but the one I have here is whatever you call it, the kind with wires that stick through holes. So it's not ideal, but this fuse was suggested by somebody on the Digital Press forums. If you're not aware of that website, Digital Press, uh, you should go there sometime. There, the forums on there have a lot of information from people who do this kind of stuff and people who collect things like I do, and it's a very cool community. I put it back in the setup and turned it on and it works fine. Well, freaking God! It worked fine before, so I'm glad I didn't break anything. Time for something a little bit more complicated. This is an NES I've had for years, and the sound has some fuzziness to it, and the sound also goes up and down in volume as I'm playing games. I think it's because there's bad capacitors in there. Now I will say the switch box that's on top of the TV that I use for this, if I mess around with it, I can make the sound become fuzzy and go out as well. So this may not be a capacitor issue, I'm not sure. But I do feel I need to take that option off the table and just replace the ca capacitors inside the NES. I get my capacitors from a website called Console 5. I'm not associated with them, they didn't give them to me for free, I just bought them with my own money. They basically sell repair items. A lot of it is capacitor replacement kits. I occasionally pause my work and just go and watch YouTube videos on how to take certain things apart. For this video, I watched several other videos on how to disassemble the NES. And it always seems to be more trouble for me than it was for them. Particularly these little connectors that I have to disconnect. I can never get them to come out the way uh, other YouTubers do. It might be because I'm a little too scared to pull on the wires themselves, so I pull on the plastic, but they eventually came out. By the way, I almost forgot, I have a problem with the NES where I'll put a game in and the game will sometimes become stuck and really hard to get back out because it doesn't eject back up. So that has to do with this little white piece here and while I'm in here, I'm going to give that a nice cleaning and remove every single bit of dirt that I can. Now the capacitors I'll be replacing are the ones shaped like cylinders. Those are the only ones that came in the kit. Those are the kind that are more likely to malfunction from leaking or just becoming old and drying out. Now here's the thing, there's a tin box here. 
that has a lot of the components that involve the sound, the power, and the signal that goes to the TV. And inside there are more capacitors. But getting inside of it is a bitch. The challenge with the box is that it's connected to the board with all these little solder points here. Five of them are legs that go onto the board that carry the signals or whatever. And the other four are just metal pieces that have tons of solder on them. And you basically have to remove all that solder and pry this thing off. And you have to do it very delicately. I can remove the shielding off one side of it, but that doesn't help me really remove it from the board itself. I've seen some people online that said you can desolder these five legs from the other side, the side that uh, where I took the door off. But I'm looking down at those points and you can see other components hooked into those solder points. So I'm paranoid about doing any work on those five points right there under my finger. So I'm going to do everything on this side and I'm going to use flux and I'm going to add solder and then I'm going to remove solder. I am the smartest man alive! <laughs> It's really hard to tell whether or not you've removed enough solder or not. I don't want to start prying this thing off and break something. I took my time and was just patient with it. The board was not damaged. So now I have this silver box and I need to get further inside of it. And I can now remove the other door on the other side of it. And you can see all kinds of things crammed into there and this is very intimidating. Some of these th things are capacitors that I'm going to replace. But I gotta be careful not to accidentally solder off the wrong components. And I gotta be careful not to burn anything while I'm sticking the soldering iron in there. It's also very tricky to go on this side of it and figure out where the legs are at. Now, the Console 5 website has a little wiki page that shows the capacitor positions. My revision didn't match any of those, so those charts were not helpful to me. I had to stare at one side and then figure out where the legs are coming out on the other side. And uh, I was able to figure it out though. So I desoldered the legs on one side and pulled the components out and dropped the new components in. And I soldered it back up, I took my time and replaced every single capacitor. And I turned it back on and it's working, that's always a good thing. But the sound still has issues, so I did not resolve the main problem. I will say, I think the picture improved a little bit. So I will continue to examine this issue and find a way to resolve it. Maybe it's the power adapter, maybe it's just the cords I'm using, but at least I have new capacitors in my NES and I don't have to worry about replacing those again for a very long time. My next repair is a handheld system, the Watara Supervision. It's basically a Game Boy competitor, and this unit has never ever worked. So uh, this will be a big challenge for me because I have no clue going in what is wrong, but I'm at least going to make an effort to open it up, take a look around and see if there's anything obvious. Now I will say, just by holding this thing in my hand, it feels very cheap, like the plastic feels cheap. The whole feel, the weight, everything, it just, it feels like a budget version of the original Game Boy. I only have one game for it, but I've always wondered what that game looks like, so I really want this thing to work. The battery compartment is rusted, so that will probably need some cleaning up, but I'm just going to put some batteries in there, and I just want to test it to see if it just fixes itself. And these batteries do have a full charge. And no, it doesn't come on, there's not a single blip on the screen, there's not a single sound out of the speaker. So I'm going to clean up the rust. And I think this is from moisture, I don't think this is from batteries. T -t Today, Junior! Some of these spring wires are coated with rust, so I'm going to try to scrape some of it off. This hook tool that I have has this rough edge to it, almost like a nail file. And I'm going to use that to kind of grind off the rust as much as I can without destroying it. So I did that cleanup, I put the batteries back in, but it still didn't work. Not a sound, not a blip, not anything. So my camera is going out of focus here, but there's basically two halves to this console. 
I'm gonna put some effort into the bottom half. I did some testing, but I'm really not that good with testing yet. It does seem like the connection to the battery compartment was good. And while I was doing that, I realized that I should try using an AC adapter to power this thing. But I never had the original AC adapter for this. And as it turns out, the original Game Boy adapter will work. And I have one of those in the form of this charging adapter. I can use this thing to run my Game Boy, even though I don't charge it. I'm not going to try to charge it, I imagine the batteries inside of it are very old. But I plugged this thing into the Watara, and nothing came on. So I dove deeper into it and took the top part off. There are a lot of screws that hold this thing together. And while I was taking the top lid off, there's this tiny little wire that connects the cartridge slot to the board, and I accidentally pulled that off. So I'll deal with that later. And the board is unremarkable. There's a lot of residue on it. I think it's from the flux they used to solder it in. Or perhaps somebody has been in here recently and tried to re-solder some stuff. There's actually two boards behind the screen and it took me a while to figure out how to separate those. I'm basically eyeballing it to see if there's anything disconnected or a bad solder joint or something like that. There does appear to be some weak solder joints. So my course of action is I'm going to reflow everything. First I gave it a good cleaning, then I added some flux, and I went in and add a little bit of solder to each joint. And I put the thing back together again, I put some batteries inside, and I turned it on. So I am getting sound, but the screen is not working. I'm actually able to start the game and play it according to the sounds I'm hearing in reaction to the buttons I'm pressing. So it's not 100% fixed, it's 50% fixed. I'll take that. I'm going to have to go back in one day and see if there's anything else I can do. But I think I need my skills to improve a little bit more before I can service the screen. So for now, I'm going to shelve this project. So that's all the repairs I'm doing on this video. I have other things I need to repair, and I have filmed other repairs, so I might make a part two eventually uh, if this video does well. If you'd like to see a part two, let me know. There's a lot of things on my to-do list. Some of them are gonna be huge challenges. So I hope you enjoyed the video. May your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. So long, everyone.